the amber bead. Carter sat by his fire and turned the bead affectionately over with his fingers, enjoying the warm smoothness of its polished surface. He was passionately fond of amber, and this bead, unusually large and of exceptionally fine quality, would make a notable addition to his large and beautiful collection. It should go, he fancied, into the Chinese section, as it appeared to be of Chinese workmanship. Probably it had belonged, long ago, to a mandarin or to a court official of high rank, and had been the gift of some emperor as a reward for meritorious service to the state. Recalling certain grim incidents of Chinese history, Carter chuckled as he speculated about the nature of the services that were so meritorious as to deserve such a handsome and valuable gift. The removal, probably, of somebody too near to the throne. Just as his eyes fell for the first time on a tiny inscription on the bead, Carter fancied that he heard behind his chair a soft rustling of silk. He turned sharply, but seeing nothing, concluded it was the breeze from the open window, stirring the curtains, and, fetching a magnifying glass from his desk, adjusted the reading lamp and set to work examining the inscription. It was exceedingly small, beautifully engraved in ancient characters, and very difficult to read. The constant soft rustling of the curtains, too, was most distracting, but at last Carter succeeded in deciphering it. It read, Flower of all the virtues, greatest rectitude. A love token, apparently, and Carter fell to musing over its recipient, so long ago turned to dust. There was a pleasant, faint perfume of amber in the air, and Carter lifted the bee to his face to inhale its fragrance. Reflected on its smooth surface, he saw something that nearly caused him to drop the bead in terror. It was the face of a young Chinese girl, exceedingly lovely and evidently of noble birth, judging by the cast of the features. The eyes were closed and the delicate little mouth drooped pathetically at the corners, infinitely sad and wistful. A terrible wound in the slender neck stretched from ear to ear, indicating all too plainly the manner of her death. A long, slim hand with tapering fingers stretched gently over his shoulder, and a silken sleeve brushed against his cheek, diffusing a wave of delicate perfume. Carter has ever since been grateful for the sudden knowledge he was vouchsafed, that there was nothing here to fear, that all the sorrow for love and pity that he was capable of was needed by this unhappy spirit. Knowing that if he looked over his shoulder he would see nothing, he kept his gaze fixed on the dead face reflected in the bead, and tried, silently, to communicate his sympathy, deliberately purging his soul of fear. He was rewarded by seeing the sad lips essay a tender little smile, and the slender hand stretch again over his shoulder, as though pleading for something just out of reach. Then he understood, and all fear departed from him. In death, her lover's token had been taken from her, the token that had been the cause of her death. And after death she longed for it, the sweet token of her lover's love. Now it could do her no more harm. But how to give it to her? Carter admits that he was dense enough to worry about the difficulty of handing a material object to a disembodied soul when the solution came to him, conveyed in some mysterious way by the girl's mind. He placed the bead on the table beside him and looked away. Then a happy sigh breathed in his ear, and when he looked again, the amber bead was gone.